What's going on, guys? Joe McCall, Real Estate Investing Mastery Podcast. Uh, hope you're doing well. This is going to be a good episode. We're going to be talking to a friend of mine, Shiloh Lundahl, who has over eight, I'm sorry, 860, 160. I bet he wishes. Maybe he doesn't. I don't know. 160 doors. And we're going to be talking about most of them are single family homes. And here's the cool thing about what he's doing is he's selling these houses on lease options. And so we're going to be talking about that. Uh, if you remember back, I did episode 997. It was a podcast called Set Your Rent with Lease Options uh, with a guy I interviewed named Adam Zach. And Adam recommended Shiloh to me. He said, you got to talk to this guy, Shiloh. He's a real good guy. He's one of the good guys. He uh, has integrity. He's doing good things for good people. So I called him up. We talked and I'm like, yeah, this is great. Let's get you on the podcast. Let's talk about what you're doing. And uh, so it's going to be good. I'm going. I'm looking forward to uh, talking to Shiloh, introducing you all to him and uh, to finding out what he's doing. And he's got a cool private practice that he's doing as well. We're going to talk about. Um, and he's got five kids, which I think is the coolest thing of all. Uh, he's got a happily married to a beautiful wife and he's got five kids. Anybody that has more than one kid, I guess I was going to say more than four kids because I have four that can be on my podcast, but the more kids you have, the better. If you want to be on my show and uh, you want to talk about how you're doing real estate while you have kids and you're being a dad and a mom and all that stuff, I would love to talk to you and get you on the show. Uh, but Hey, first, before we bring Shiloh on, I want to let you all know a couple things. We are doing this live right now on the YouTubes and the Facebook. And so if you're watching right now on YouTube or Facebook, please say hi. Tell us where you're from. Type your questions and comments in the chat, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube, and they will pop up here. Say hi. And I would love to get the feedback and the interaction. Give us a thumbs up, like the channel. If you're listening on audio for the podcast, Real Estate Investing Mastery, I'm really glad you're here. You guys uh, have been listening to this podcast for 10 years. This coming in a couple months, it'll be 10 years. I've done over a thousand episodes and just, you know, what's kept me going with this in you know, the first couple of years, I didn't even know what my stats were. And it's probably, I didn't know how to look up how many people were listening or not. And it was probably a good thing that I didn't know how to look that up. But uh, you guys are listening on the audio podcasting world. Um, you, you are my, um, you are my, my, uh, my best friends. I love you guys because uh, that is, that's my heart and soul and why I do this thing. I just kind of happen to do it on YouTube live, but my real intent and purpose of this is to get it out there into an audio podcast because that's where like 75, 85% of my uh, listeners are. So if you are watching this on YouTube and Facebook, hi, um, say hello, tell us where you're from, type any questions that you have in the chat. Okay. And we've already got a few of them right here. What's up, Brutus? What's going on? And Aronoff, how you doing? And uh, oh, we got here the Fifth Seal Ministries, Lake Charles, Louisiana, in the Gulf Coast. Nice. I was doing a webinar yesterday, and we had people from Spain, people from Israel, and people from somewhere in South America on my webinar. So I love how people from all over the world are listening in and watching this right now. All right. So final thing to uh, house cleaning stuff here. Uh, this podcast is brought to you by my brand new offer software. If you go to partnerwithjoe.net, I have this new software that's free where it will help you create offers. Um, and I have a light version that you get for free. There's a premium version that's just seven bucks. Uh, but if you go to partnerwithjoe.net, you'll get the free calculator. And I'm going to give you a little training on how to use it. And uh, you, I'm going to show you an opportunity where you can actually partner with me on deals. Not only will I partner with you on deals, I will lend you money on your deals. So I'm excited about this new project I just started partnerwithjoe.net. If you go there, you get the calculator for free. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about my $7 a month partner with Joe program. It's a new $30, 30 day course. It's only seven bucks, but it's a 30 day course. It teaches you how to get your first deal as quick as possible. It's amazing. The, the amount of value that I'm putting into this, um, because I want to partner with y'all on some deals and I will partner with you. And I'll also lend you money on the deals. If you want, if you're looking for a lender on your deals. So check that out, partner with Joe. Net. I think that's enough introduction and house cleaning stuff. Let's bring Shiloh on. What do you guys say? Shiloh Lundahl, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you for the intro. Very so I just want to, I want to correct just a few things about that intro. Um, okay. One is uh, we actually are close up to about 200 units, but only okay. about 60 of them are lease options. And then um, uh, about four, no, we have about six small mobile home parks. We have a 12-plex, a 6-plex, and then the rest are single families that we are selling on lease options. 
Okay. All right. Cool. That's still a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's awesome. Good for you. The video is a little choppy. I'm not sure if it's me or you. Am I choppy on your end? or? No, you look great. Do I look choppy? A little bit, but don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. So we can still hear you just fine. Okay. Um, all right, Shiloh. So where are you? Where are you from? Where do you live? So I'm in Mesa, Arizona. Okay. And um, I've been here for uh, the last about 13 years. But there was a, a four-year stint where I moved my family to uh, Burbank, California, because uh, one of my daughters actually does some acting in California. And so we moved out there to give her kind of some opportunities to do some acting. And then my family just moved back to Arizona uh, last year. I muted myself because I, <laughs> I was checking our YouTube video to see it is. I think I look fine, but you're a little spotty. But don't again, don't worry Let about me, it. The audio is fine. This helps at all. Let me know if that just helped at all. Yeah, I'm not sure. Anyway, okay. okay so you're in Mesa, Arizona right now. How long yes. have you been uh, in the real estate game? So uh, I bought my first single family home in 2010. And then I didn't do anything else until 2014 when the building that I have my, um, my therapy practice out of came up for sale. And then I, I worked towards purchasing this building. And then that's what kind of sparked the idea that I'd like to do some more real estate investing. Then I partnered with a buddy of mine. And then in 2015 is really where I started to do more real estate investing. All right. Well, let's talk about your practice. What do you do? And I think this is really cool. So I'm a child and family therapist. And so I focus primarily on helping. Uh, I do like marital counseling and individual counseling, but I focus primarily on helping parents with their children. And so that's like my my niche. And I, I do a lot of work with um, uh, adoptive, well, with parents of adopted children and just parents of biological kids. That's kind of my niche. Oh, man, that's fantastic. Good for you. Mm -hmm. And it's got to be hard being a parent and having kids that know that you do that, right? Do, you, do your kids ever call you to the carpet and say, hey, you know, are you practicing what you preach or something? Right. Like, that would be my biggest fear. Say, hey, dad, do you do this in therapy too, huh? Do you yeah. do this with your client? No, they don't say that. Um, so, uh, no, it's it's interesting. Um, I really enjoy it. I, I like having, you know, five kids because I've had several different personalities that I've had to learn how to work with. And so that's given me uh, a great, I, I guess, wealth of experience of working with my kids to help other people work with their kids, even though every kid is a little bit different. Yeah. Um, just all of the experience that I've had over the years of working with so many kids, you start to see patterns of behaviors. You start to, to see the, the underlying needs that kids have, those needs of security, knowing that the relationship is secure between the parent and the child. And then when that happens um, and the parent can kind of help their kids be able to organize their emotions and work through difficult things, their behaviors tend to go down. And so that's what I work with a lot is helping parents be able to regulate themselves emotionally so that they can help their kids regulate themselves emotionally. And then they can correct their kids' behavior a lot easier. So that's kind of the process that I use. Have, have you ever done this? Uh, smell the roses, blow out the candles. <laughs> You know, I have not done that a lot of specific technique, um, but uh, I get I got that the other day from a parenting magazine. There's a magazine called Focus on the Family. And they're a Christian ministry or whatever, and they have a magazine. And that was one of the things that they tell you to teach your kids sure. when they when they need to calm down. Smell the roses and blow out the candles. I love it. Here, here's a different technique that works pretty well. It's called the whoa, whoa, whoa technique. OK, you have a kid that starts flipping out. So you go, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, 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 hey. What's going on? That's helpful. It's the basically, you know, the kids kind of going all over the place. You're like, whoa, whoa, hey, hey, buddy, buddy, buddy. Tell me what's going on. Let me help you. Let me see if I can help you. Tell me what's going on. I bet you're that great with sellers too, right? When you're talking to sellers. Um, you know, I actually don't do a lot of talking to sellers specifically. I get most of my deals from uh, wholesalers or the MLS or my partner does some advertising. So I don't do any, you know, direct to seller marketing. I have talked with a few sellers, but not many. I've had two acquisition managers and they were both pastors, former pastors. And I didn't do that on purpose, just by accident. Um, mm -hmm. But I love these guys because they were so personal. When you were talking to them, they were listening. They were like, 
really intentfully listening. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember, and they were just wanting some extra money. They were still kind of doing ministry part-time, but just wanting some extra money. Sure. I thought, man, these guys would be so good. They're not going to be the slick, hardcore salesmen that kind of like try to trick you into saying yes or using NLP tricks or whatever. But they're just like, they were really good listeners and they connected really well. And, and I did tons and tons of deals with these guys. And they're both involved in real estate, doing both really, really well, even though we don't work together anymore. Yeah. But isn't there something powerful with the, just this having listening skills? Well, the idea is if you can listen well, the goal of listening is to understand, you know, what's the this person feeling? Because their behavior is stemming from what it is that they're feeling. And so if I can hear them, I need to look past some of the, deta the details of what they're saying to understand more of what they're feeling. Then when I can understand what they're feeling, then I can also understand what it is that they need. When we can find out what, what people need, what our kids need, what our spouse needs, and we can meet that need and help them get that need met, their emotions start to shift and then their behaviors start to shift. So that's a lot of what I, I help my, um, my clients learn is this kind of formula. You slow down and you connect before you correct. You slow down, connect, before you correct. And that works really, really well in helping um, yeah. kids, you know, with their emotions. It helps parents know how to help their kids. And so, but I mean, that's the same thing with, with basic, you know, human nature and, and working with people. Slow it down, listen to what they're saying because they're feeling something. Understanding where that feeling's coming from will help you understand the needs that they have. You know, and, and people have four basic, you know, needs that start with the letter S. So one is they need to feel safe, you know, and then the next one is secure. And then the next one is they need support. And the last one is they need to feel less stress. So those are the needs that you're kind of looking for. Which one is it? Which one is generating all of this emotion? Is it about they need safety? Is it about they need that feeling yeah. of security or support? Or is it that they're feeling stressed out and they just need you to help them with that? You know, I reminds me of a podcast I did with a guy. Um, I did this in October. 2020 uh -huh. and he met was it this guy um hold on here this is so good oh yeah he measures this was an interview i did with a good friend of mine philip vincent episode 922 uh, he was talking about how he he's really got a niche in the probate industry where he's helping people not even probate but like before a senior citizen goes into um living care or whatever assisted mm -hmm. living and um, he measures success by how many hugs that he gets in a day. Mm -hmm. um, it's not about getting the best deal with the most equity or the biggest uh, uh, discount. It's about whether he measures success by how many hugs he gets in a deal. Mm -hmm. um, well, you know what? Do, 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 do. It wasn't him. Because I'm looking at my, ah, uh, never mind. But Philip Vincent does do that a lot. If you, if any of you all know Philip Vincent, hug. I, I wish I could remember what episode that was. I'll find it later. Hmm. Oh, I talked about it in October. It's episode 551, October 2017, episode 551. You measure success by a hug. All right. Anyway, uh, your kids. You have five kids, mm -hmm. right, Shiloh? Mm -hmm. And uh, did, did you adopt any of your kids? Nope, they're all biological. Okay. All from cool. one wife. One, all right, one cool. and you're wife. still married? I'm still married. Congratulations. How, that's awesome. How long have you been married? We've been married uh, coming up on 18 years. Nice. How old are your kids? The oldest, um, wait, well, it can't be 18 years. Maybe coming up on 17 years. Um, so my oldest is uh, 15. So she came about one year after uh, we were married. Um, and so she'll be 16 here in July. And then we have a 14-year-old, an 11-year-old who does the acting in California. And then we have a six-year-old and a two-year-old. Wow. So you actually moved to California because of the acting that she was involved mm -hmm. with. Okay, cool. Yep. Um, you're a pretty busy family guy. You got a mm -hmm. pretty successful, busy practice. Mm -hmm. um, how do you find time to do real estate? So, you know, I, I have been working a lot. And so I'm just now kind of actually backing off on the number of hours that I spend um, doing therapy. So rather than doing like 30 sessions a week, I'll do about 20 sessions a week now. Um, and so basically the way that I do real estate is 
a lot in, in the in-between time. So basically in between this and in between that that I have to be at, I do real estate in between that. And so I have different systems set up that allows me to do it to where it's um, active, but also semi-passive. In other words, um, I, I don't go to the properties very often. Um, I have an assistant that helps me with everything. And so it allows me to have my job and still get a lot done. So that was one thing that I learned. I did actually have a, a real estate coach back in 2016 that um, said two things that were really profound and he drilled those into me. And one was, you need to learn how to use other people's money because you're gonna run out of money. And then the second was, um, you need to hire an assistant. So those were the two things that he pounded in over and over and over again. And um, those are two things that I learned how to do. You know, I got an assistant and the first one, the first assistant that I had was, uh, she was okay, but also she had a lot of like personal family things that were, you know, very difficult for her. And so when I'd give her a call to ask her to go do something, and I'd say, hey, how was your day? And then she'd just, you know, fall apart and stuff. I'm like, uh, you know, there's that therapy side of me that wants to go and be a support and understand and, and things like that. But then there's the business side of me that says, I called you because I need you to go to this property and do this task. And so it was... It was difficult because what I really yeah. needed is I needed an assistant that was, um, you know, uh, in a good place emotionally and, and with family and everything that could be able to accomplish the tasks that I needed to accomplish. Oh, myself. my gosh. That opens so, up a huge can of worms, doesn't it? Because, like, I don't allow my team to have any drama in my <laughs> business, right? Zero drama. I'm not paying you to give me any drama. And if you don't, if you don't shut up, I don't say that. <laughs> okay, um, good. But good. you're fired. <laughs> like, I just can't handle that. Um, I have enough drama at home. Yeah. So, yeah, how do you deal with that? Especially well, you, as a therapist? You've heard the, the phrase, um, hire slow, fire yeah. fast. Yeah. Well, I did it the opposite. I hired fast, and then I fired slow, right? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. basically, um, you know, uh, I needed somebody, uh, she was a referral from somebody else. And so I got her to start working for me. But the thing is, there was a lot of things I needed her to do that she didn't have that skill level in doing. Okay, yeah. And so I really wanted her to, and so I was kind of trying to carry her along thinking eventually she'd get it. And then um, my partner and I, my business partner and I, we went and had lunch with this um, lady that had had a, she brought a deal to Zillow as kind of a bird dog. She was working with a, um, was that she was working with another investor. And so yeah. when we got this deal, we thought, why don't we just reach out to her and maybe she can find some deals for us. Okay. And so we had lunch with her and she was really sharp. Um, she spoke both English and Spanish and, and we have a lot of um, rentals that have some uh, Spanish speakers in there. We thought, you know, this would be really nice. Um, yeah, yeah. And so we asked her if uh, we gave her, you know, a task or two here and there to do if she'd be willing to do it. And she's like, yeah, sure. And so we gave her a couple of tasks and within a few hours they were done. And then we gave her a couple more and then they were done. And we're like, wow, this lady's like super efficient and she's awesome. She has a great attitude and she's just a pleasant person. And so basically what happened is we, we started to give less and less tasks to the assistant that I had and more and more tasks to her until eventually we stopped giving my other assistant tasks. And now they weren't employees, they were 1099, you know, contract em employees basically. And so um, it worked out really well. We just kind of lessened the one's tasks and increased the other one's tasks. And so then it was so interesting, as soon as we got her, our business just took off. Right. And we, yeah, I mean, last year, so she came and started working for us, I think sometime in 2018. In 2020, last year, we purchased 110 properties. Well, how, how 110 long units. Been? Just last, in 2020, wow. we increased our portfolio from about, um, I think it was 80 to 190. And a lot had to do with her. Okay. So just because she was so efficient and she worked really hard and did a fantastic job. And so what was really, really cool was we recognized her value and we gave her a raise. And then we were talking with our accountant just recently and we we're restructuring our, our company so that we're gonna be um, bringing her on as a 2% a owner of our company. And so now she has ownership 
uh, the portion of the company. And, uh, and so it's awesome because our company is valued at probably about four to 5 million now in asset wow. well in, um, in equity. And so, um, now she was able to just get that as a bonus and then everything we build, you know, moving forward, she's going to get 2% of that. And so we're really excited over the next, uh, 10 years, uh, we're, our plan is to help her become a millionaire. So I love it. Mm -hmm. We've got some good comments in here. Um, we've got, uh, Daniel, what's going on, uh, from Ohio. The video is a lot better too, by the way. Oh, okay. Good. Um, and do you know Brandon Simmons? Yeah, I know him. Good guy. I love Brandon. Known Brandon for a long time. Fifth Seal Ministries. What's your name, by the way? Just curious. Louisiana. I already showed that one. Uh, Avanoff or Aronoff is asking nationwide. I'm not sure. Where where are all your properties, Shiloh? So most of my properties are in Arizona. And when I say Arizona, you have, you know, the, the Phoenix area. And then you have what's called the East Valley. The East Valley is just everything kind of east of Phoenix and Scottsdale. Oh, do and you know Brandon because he sold you deals? Is that how you know him? Um, I think yeah, I think I bought a deal from him before. I mean, again, we have a lot of deals. And so I've worked with a lot of hosts. You got to be careful with probably, Brandon. <laughs> I think we probably bought a deal from him. Yeah. But um, so in, in the East Valley of Arizona, you have Gilbert, which is where I live. And Gilbert is a nice, it's a nice area. And I don't own any other properties in Gilbert because the price to rent ratio is just not great, in my opinion, um, in order to own rental properties there. But I have several in Mesa. And then you go farther out. I have a bunch in Apache Junction. Then you go to the south. And then I have these smaller cities. So Florence, Coolidge, and Casa Grande is where I own the majority. And then just last year, we went down to, into Tucson, bought a 12-plex, and then two mobile home parks. And so we own about... 50 to 60 properties down there. Excellent. So how are you buying these? Are you using your own cash? Are you getting bank financing for each of them? You know, when did you, yeah, answer that first. And then I have another sure. question. So um, when I bought the building that I have my practice in, I opened up a equity line of credit on my home. I was able to get a, a $200,000 equity line. And then that was helpful to kind of get me started in real estate investing. Okay. And so I had that. I was able to do some of my own deals with that money. But then again, as my coach said, you're going to run out of money if you're just using your own money. You need to learn how to use other money. So then I you know, looked at, okay, what are some other options? And in this uh, <clears throat> real estate program that I did, you know, they talked about other uh, money resources such as business lines of credit, personal lines of credit, credit cards, and things like that. And so over the next like year, I worked really hard with banks and other um, you know, institutions in order to increase my credit limits. And I was able to increase them to about $800,000, including like 250,000 of available on credit cards. I had probably 150 in um, you know, business lines of credit, about 100 or so in personal lines. And then I had my, uh, my HELOC on my home. So that was kind of where I was able to use that in order to buy properties basically. Um, so that was really helpful. That kind of gave me the start. But then um, I bought a bunch of properties and then I went to go and refinance them. And at the beginning, you know, they'd say, well, we're only going to refinance you about, you know, 70% of your, your purchase or 80% of your purchase plus rehab, as long as that's less than 70% of cost or something like that. And so basically I was leaving in, you know, a lot of money into these rehabs. And then I went to lunch one day with a guy and he said, well, why don't you just, you know, use seconds on the back end? I'm like, well, what are you talking about? It's like, yeah, you know, you, the first is the bank or the hard money lender. And then just bring on a private money lender in a second position, you know, a small second. And then you can pull out money that way. And I thought, well, that's brilliant. And so I started trying to create these second position notes. But at the time, this was back in 2000, I think 17, the beginning of 2017, uh, nobody wanted to get these seconds. And, you know, they didn't, a lot of people didn't know me really well. And so I knew that as soon as I sold one second, that I'd be able to sell 10 of them. Yeah. And so basically what I was doing is um, like, let's say I had a property that was worth um, a hundred and I had a loan on it for 70. I was trying to sell a second for 10,000 and I would be paying between eight and 10% on that second, depending on the length of time, um, whether it was one, two or three years. Right. And so um, as soon as I did sell one, within the same week, I sold two more. And then um, people started to feel you know, comfortable with me. And then as soon as I sold it, my entire 
um, you know, uh, what would you call it? My, my energy around that changed my, my confidence. confidence, my, my confidence, you know, I was able to talk about it, having done it successfully, yeah. people felt that, and then they were willing to lend me money. And then, you know, I post a lot on bigger pockets and, you know, a lot of people see my posts and they'll, they'll comment on them or they'll like my posts and then they'll read my bio and then they'll see that I do some coaching and other things like that. They might reach out to me and talk about either doing a deal with me or, or lending to me on one of my deals or do some doing coaching with me or whatever. And so that's kind of where I've got a lot of, uh, a lot of money is people reaching out to me saying that they want to lend to me on my deals. And then we put them on our WhatsApp group and our WhatsApp group is kind of this mini, um, investing oh, group. WhatsApp like, group. I've never heard of that. Yeah. So WhatsApp is, is just an app that you yeah. get. And it's kind of like a, a texting, a video texting app. A lot of people outside of the United States use it because sure. you can do free calling on it. Yeah. And so you don't have to pay for international calls when you use WhatsApp. It uses your data rather than the, the phone lines. And so a lot of people outside the U.S. use it. And so um, I was uh, just kind of, as people would lend to me, we would put them on this WhatsApp group and then we would do these like little trainings and we'd answer questions and then other people on the group would answer questions. And so it just kind of became this little mini investing community, which is... So just, I'm sorry, just so I'm yeah, clear, nice. WhatsApp group is like, um, is it voice messaging or just text or is it... What, what, it's, you're, it's you're both. So, a group of people. Yeah, so you put everybody into like, it's kind of like this group text. And um, well, there's this group and then you can either text them you can send pictures, you can send video, and you can send and you can call people with it. So how did you start the group and how did you get people into it? Uh, so I, I'm part of this kind of leadership program and the leadership program used WhatsApp all the time. And so I saw what they were doing and how they were doing it. And it was awesome. I'm like, wow, this is really effective to communicate with an entire group. And so this leadership group was, you know, doing a lot of leadership training and things like that and using the WhatsApp to do it. And so I saw what they were doing and how they were doing it. And I thought, this is really great. What if I were to use this as part of my, my investor group? And so that's kind of how we got started with it. And, uh, and it works really great. I, how I really many people it. do you have in it? Well, we have about 60. So 60 people that have lent to us in one form or not of another, um, one form or another, like 10,000 to like 100,000. And then what's also been really cool real quick is that, you know, as we've been doing some of these trainings, I reached out uh, earlier this year and kind of sent some videos saying, hey, guys, I just want to let you know about this new mastermind group that I'm a part of. And I talked about it and said, it's really great. And I said, a lot of you guys might want to reach out to each other and start some mastermind groups. And so there's been two mastermind groups started just among this group of people, you know, where they get together and like every week or every other week and they talk about the, either the challenges or the wins and, and what their goals are with with investing. And so that is really, really effective having these little ma uh, mini mastermind groups that they make. And then it just kind of creates more of a cohesive group. And um, it's just been really, really neat. I have never heard of that before. I mean, I've heard of WhatsApp, but like, I think it's such a cool idea. What a great communication tool. Mm -hmm. When you have that many people in it though, does it, you know, you, do you, do you, does it get pretty overwhelming with like, so many people responding to, or because it's just one conversation thread, right? It's not broken yep. up. It's just one conversation thread. And um, you can always just turn off your notifications so that you don't get notified when people are responding. So it doesn't like constantly buzz or whatever. But um, uh, what I find is uh, like every day, I would say there's just a, a handful of texts, if that's so maybe about 20 or 30 a week. So not a whole, like it isn't bombarding you, but like, uh, for instance, somebody um, reached out today and said, hey, uh, would it be a good idea to, you know, create a partnership on on my first or second deal? Or should I wait until, you know, later on, like fifth or, or tenth deal? And so a couple of people reached out and, um, uh, you know, commented on that. And then I did a little video that I didn't have a chance to post yet because we're doing this, you know, uh, podcast. But um, after this podcast, I'm going to post it, just kind of this video that I did of me kind of talking and doing this explanation and everything like that. So that's what's really great is you can do these little videos where you can kind of teach and then send them out. And then so people learn quite a bit from that. Wow. I'm looking at WhatsApp now and you can do this on your iPhone, Android, or even your yeah. computer, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What a great idea. Another thing is when we, uh, so when my partner and I, my partner and I have kind of this contest going to see who can get uh, a thousand subscribers on YouTube first. 
And so we'll post our little uh, videos on on our um, on the WhatsApp group, so people can you know click on there and then go over to YouTube and watch our our little YouTube trainings that we're doing and stuff like that. Our videos that we're making. So and um, go ahead. With WhatsApp, do they are you giving them your cell phone number? Uh, yeah, like everybody in the group has my cell phone number. Ah, yeah, because okay. they they lent digital. money. Yeah, so they've <laughs> lent money to me. Right. Okay, and so okay. we have a relationship. Um, and so my WhatsApp is connected to my personal cell phone number, but okay. you can connect it to a, it doesn't have to be your personal number. You can connect it to a, I, actually, I don't know hundred percent. I don't know exactly how that works with the WhatsApp group and your number, but I'm okay with it because again, all of these people are able to give me a call because they've lent me money and I've, and they can yeah, go yeah. And, and ask me questions and things like that, but it's just more effective for them to do it through the, the group because then That's they may have a question that may be able to go out to everyone on the group. I, uh, I love that idea. And um, mm -hmm. I've, WhatsApp definitely is used all around the world um, more than, I think it might be the number one or the number two messaging app in the entire world, right? I think so, yeah. And it doesn't matter. So yeah, my, my private investors have my cell phone number, but I, I love the idea of being able to communicate and uh, you can control the notifications too. So your phone's not just going crazy, right? You can sit down like once a day or twice a day and mm -hmm. just look at messages and respond. Yeah. And it just kind of has like a number next to it. So you know how many people have like sent things. And so then you can just kind of open up when you get a chance and then you kind of go through the thread and answer things that you need to. And, and you can answer by text, by writing or voice or video, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. What do you normally do? Um, I'll usually just do a text. But if it's like something that I am going to kind of talk about because it's a more complicated thing, then I'll do a video of me kind of explaining something. And then you can post like up to five minute videos. So I'll do, you know, ho hopefully I can explain a concept in five minutes. If I can't, then I'll do a five minute, you know, and then I pause it and then I'll do a second segment in a second. And then every Friday, I just started this a couple weeks ago, but I do update Friday. And so I'll talk about, okay, this is everything that went on with our real estate this week. You know, we were able to rent this uh, place out. We just finished this property. We were able to acquire this one. We're closing on this one. Um, and so we go over everything that we're doing so that people know that when people lend us money or we're, when we're doing teaching, we're actually actively involved in, in what we're teaching. Does that make sense? Yeah, so yeah. They can see us. Then they can ask questions specifically about a specific property that we did, or they can ask us about, um, you know, what we're thinking about the market right now or you know, how we were able to acquire that specific property, whatever it was or is, we're able to talk about. And another thing that I'm enjoying doing is I'm giving them updates about my pool in the, in the, what's in our update Friday, because my pool is being built right now. And oh. it's a, a nice pool. It's a very large, nice pool with an, like a cave rock feature. Oh yeah. So, so that's really been fun. And it's been taking, you know, it's taken about four months so far to, to build. And so um, it should be done uh, by the end of May. And then we're going to have a kind of a pool opening party for, you know, people on the, in our investor group and everything like that to come over that are in town. Cause I would say about um, half of the people are in Arizona. The other half are outside of Arizona. Um, so, you know, whoever is close enough or welcome to come and, you know, enjoy the pool. That's so cool. I'm I'm um, jealous because I'm trying to figure out how to we're going to build a pool and what size we want and getting mm -hmm. a real nice one here. All right, we'll so send you um, some pictures of our pool. My wife yeah. uh, kind of designed it. It's it's really awesome. Well, that's cool. I love what you're doing here with um, with WhatsApp and connecting your private investors mm -hmm. with that. And um, mm -hmm. that's such a great idea. Well, All right, actually, so, real quick, there. Yeah, yeah. So th those ones were actually like private lenders. And that was because we didn't want to, you know, go afoul of the the SEC or anything like that. Because what we would do is we just take one and put them on the back end of, of one of our properties in a second. And we were able to do that because it was just like one person per property. Yeah, we yeah. weren't commingling funds or anything sure, like that. Of course. But now we've actually built up. We just finished a fund um, that we've created nice, in okay. order to now we can have investors come in and invest a lot, commingle the money, and then do a lot of deals. And so we just finished that this last week. So that's right. actually something I'm super excited about. So are you still getting uh, individual loans on each of your properties as you as they come in? Or are you getting big commercial loans now? Or are you packaging them together and stuff like that? We're, we're packaging them together now. Yeah. So we were doing the individual 
And then we built up several individual loans and then we packaged them all, put them in a portfolio. And then they were in a portfolio for like a year and a half. And then, you know, appreciation happened so much. And the terms of that portfolio weren't great. And it was hard to, you know, remove one property. And uh, like in case that somebody were to exercise the lease option, we wanted to be able to take out one property without different penalties and stuff like that. So then we refinanced that portfolio with another bank that allows us to do that, where we can okay. take out one, it'll lower the payment and the whole loan and things like that, and without any penalty. And so that's why we refinanced it recently. So we're doing a lot of portfolio loans. We still get these little loans here and there on some of our properties, but they're all mostly commercial now. Um, so that's how we're doing that. And that sounds intimidating to somebody who's kind of new to the business and, you know, just getting started. Um, so can you talk to them a little bit? Like, could you explain um, it's not, well, was it intimidating to you when you were first getting your, your first loans and then looking at getting bigger commercial loans? And, and was it that hard to transition from the you know, It wasn't intimidating to me. I think that I walked into it with overconfidence. I thought, hey, this is going to be great. You know, they're going to see that I, I do well as a therapist and that I have these properties. They're just going to give me money. And so that was my thought. And so I went in there and um, no, it was, uh, it's like going in to get a loan as an investor is almost like going in a boxing match or an MMA. Okay, yeah, you were supposed MMA to say it's not intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm just letting it. you know. Awesome. It's fine. I mean, it really is. You're going in there. They're going to ask for a bunch of stuff. You're like, I don't know why that's relevant. Okay, let me get you that. But this is the thing that's important. Keep fighting. Keep yeah. fighting until it's done. And then this is another thing that's also really important. There are certain standards and guidelines. Learn those. Learn the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac standards and guidelines. Also understand when it is that they changed, like they changed recently. Understand that and then work towards meeting those guidelines. But at the same time, each bank can be a little bit different. So I encourage people to work with at least two banks at the same time, all the time when they're getting loans. And the reason being is because you can have one bank that you know plays a great game and says, hey, everything's going to be great. We're going to take you and it's going to be awesome. We're going to get you that finish line. Everything's going to be great. And then they take you 90% of the way. And then you get a call and they say, I'm sorry, our underwriter said that he didn't like this. We're not going to be able to do this for you. Oh, yeah. And so you're left there after two months of working with this person like two or three times a week. And now you're like, well, what do I do now? Now I have to start this process all over again. Yeah. But when you work with another bank at the same time, then you're able to say, okay, well, that one stopped. Then I just finish up with this bank. You know what I mean? Or if both of them get to the finish line, then you say, okay, so um, now let me know, you know, your rate and everything like this. Okay, because this other bank is ready to close with me as well. And they're giving me a little bit better rate. And so I would much, I'd like to go with you, but this is what I'm going to need to see. Are you able to do that? If not, then I have to go with the other bank. Now they may be upset by that, but then you can ask them this question. What about this is upsetting you? Well, I did all of this work. I know that you did all of that work and I appreciate that. And these are the things that I like about your bank. And it, but these are the other things that I need in a bank. And so I'm not going to get all of my needs met with one bank. Now that I understand how you work more, I'm going to bring these type of deals to you because you would, you lend better on these types of deals. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to take these types of deals to them. Does that make sense? Because oh, yeah. That's really smart. A, a lot of banks are, are funny that way. They think, you know what, Hey, we want you to, they call it the relationship. Basically what that means is we want you to bring all of your money over to our bank if we're going to give you a loan. Okay, well, I'll do that as long as you meet all of my needs. Oh, if you yeah. don't meet all of my needs, why do you expect me to be 100% faithful for you, you know, towards you as a bank, if you're not going to help me get all of the things done that I need to do with all of my properties? Yep. So there's only a couple people that I have 100% faithful to, and that's my wife and my kids. Those are the only people that I have to be completely faithful to. Everybody else, as long as this relationship works for both you and me, then we're going to continue to move forward with it. But when this doesn't work well for either of us, then it's okay. We're not married to each other. We'll move on, and it'll be okay. We'll do things that work but good for the both of us. Now, that's that's my feel. Well, that's a good attitude to have going into it. You know, you're not their slave. You're not going to be... Uh, the, don't get me started on that. Um, that can be very frustrating. <laughs> you, frustrating. You've had some feelings towards banks, I guess. Yes. Yeah. They yeah. promise you the moon. Oh, we'll do this, all this great stuff for you. And they get you right to the end of the finish line. And it's like, yeah, it's not going to work. Yeah. All because of one stupid little thing. And it's right. Like, but right. if they told you two months ago, boom, you could have fixed it. 
Yes. It's like I had 10,000 in this account. I could have put it in this account two yeah. months ago. But now that we're two months away, you say, oh, because I didn't have 10,000 more in this account, then it's a problem. And I can't just put it in there now because then we have to wait two more months. Yeah. And then we're outside oh. of the, the period of time when we're supposed to get it done. And then we have to restart everything again. Yeah, it's it's the whole left hand isn't talking to the right hand and yeah. nobody knows what's going so on. So when, when you understand that really, really well, then it becomes less frustrating. Because really? this is what I understood with banks. And I was really frustrated with banks for a long time. But when I understood this, that banks get their money from somewhere. Imagine how they, they get their money. A lot of times, big, big wealthy investors fund banks. And the wealthy investors say, this is what I want. I'm going to create a box that says, these are the, these are the type of loans I want to do. Okay, And then I'll create a box just a little bit outside of that box saying, these are loans that I might do as long as these stipulations. Those are the only loans I want to do. Anything outside of those two boxes? No. Yeah. It's my money. And so I can choose who I, lo who I loan it to and who I don't loan it to. Once I realized that, I started taking it a lot less personal when I wasn't fitting in their box. And I started asking better questions like, describe what your box looks like and describe to me what kind of people get loans. What are the things that I need to look out for? What are things that would commonly disqualify me for that type of loan? So I get all this information. I then restructure my finances and my business to look like that. And then I go and I apply for the loan and I usually get the loan. Yeah, good. And what kind of banks do you like to work with? Are they regional banks, local banks, national? You know what I mean? Credit unions? And to be honest, I work with lots of banks. Like I've had accounts at like seven different banks. Now it's cumbersome and it's frustrating, especially to my accountant. But I do that because some banks will lend me, hey, here's $50,000. Great. But you don't have any other products that are going to help me. So I'm going to take that 50000 and then I'm just going to pay you back. But I, I'd like that 50000 because I can take that. You're giving it to me at 6%. I can take that and I can create, you know, several hundred dollars of cash flow over and above what I pay you and, you know, more equity and stuff. And then there's banks like I like uh, Chase Bank for two things. It's convenient. And it has a great online system. I don't like it for almost anything else. When you call to get help, they say, okay, uh, give me your name. Okay, um, identify yourself, you know, and then they'll ask you some questions. Where did you open up this account? I don't know. Well, what do you mean? I have 60 different accounts with you. I have no idea where I opened up that one oh specific gosh. account. Yeah. Um, okay, well, you failed the identification. It's me. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. That's frustrating with the big banks because they it's very impersonal. Um, but I like uh, I like working with some smaller banks with regard to getting you know uh, some of my real estate loans from them. But I, I built relationships with specific bankers, less about banks and more about bankers. And if my bankers leave the banks that they're in, it's likely I will be taking my business and following them to their Interesting. next. Interesting. Just because it's it's more about the relationship that I have with that specific banker and what they can do for me than it is about their institution. Nice. Because uh, without them, nobody else, you know, if nobody else knows me, then, and I say, hey, will you do this for me? Can you do that for me? Um, you know, I'm busy with other things. You seem like you're high needs. I'm going to go and do all, all of these other things. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? All right. So you got almost 200 doors, mm -hmm. um, about 70 single family homes, right? Yes. And so your, seven, your 70 single family homes, those are the ones you put your lease option tenant buyers in, right? Yes. All right. So you're, you're buying them with bank financing and you're selling them on a lease option. Can you explain? So I'll, I'll walk you through that. Yeah. Yeah. I'll walk you through that process. So we buy them usually with hard money because we usually buy them off market. Okay. And so when we buy them off market, we buy them with hard money and then I'll usually bring in a second to help with the rehab. So most of our deals, most of them, we don't have a lot of our own money into them. Um, so I'll ha have a hard money lender, then a private money lender. And then when we're finished with the rehab, then we go and we get it refinanced. And, you know, depending on the bank might depend on the amount of time for seasoning and other things like that. And if we can find ways around seasoning, then we do. Um, but then what we do is we will uh, get it refinanced, pay off the first and the second. And then when they come in with their option fee, and their option fee is usually about uh, 3900 usually. Sometimes it's a little bit more if it's a higher price point property. That, you know, four or 5000 will help us usually get almost the rest of our money out of the deal. So now we have, you know, close to none of our own money into the deal. 
they're into the property. We're able to rent it for, you know, $100 usually on average, higher than the rent. But then what we also do is we rent it for $100 more than that. So $200 more than the rent, the average rent. And then what we do is we have a, a nuisance clause that basically says that if they don't bother us asking us to fix anything, you know, or anything like that, if they just take care of the house because they're living in it in order to be able to qualify for loans so they can buy it, if they just take care of it, then they get a $100 discount off of the rent. So we increase it 200 and then we give them 100 back. So our net is a hundred higher than your average rent. You should give them that credit if and when they buy the house, right? No, that's just off of their rent. So oh, basically, oh, I see. They so pay a hundred less. Let's say the the house would rent for two for twelve hundred. We charge them fourteen hundred because it's with the option. Uh, just because we charge a higher, we charge a premium rent for option, you know, buyers, and then we give them a discount of a hundred dollars from there. So basically, it's net a hundred dollars higher. In rent for us. Does that make sense? I love it. So it's like, if you leave me alone, I'll knock a hundred dollars off your rent every month. Yes. Not like exactly like that, but yes, it is. It's basically like that. Man. Can you send me a copy of that nuisance clause? Is that what you call it? A nuisance? Yeah. Clause? It's just, it's just a small paragraph in our, in our lease option agreement. I love that. And so, and it works really, really well because I would say our lease option properties are probably less than a third of the time that it takes us to manage any of our rentals. Oh yeah. So I would say probably even a quarter of the time and effort it takes. Oh yeah. So, I mean, you say you want to build up to a hundred dollars or a hundred property uh, rental portfolio and the amount of time that that takes that same amount of time, you could manage a 400 property um, lease option um, portfolio yeah. in the yeah, same amount sure. of time. All right. So um, what's your typical cash flow then? What do you net cash flow on these deals? You know, that is a, a good question because um, we haven't been taking out cash flow for so long because we've been, uh, since we started it, I mean, we just started like the last month or two taking out some money in cash flow. But for the first three or four years, we were just building the company and you know, reinvesting that cash flow into more deals and more deals and more nice, deals. Okay. So like according to my spreadsheet, we get about $118,000 a month in um, uh, in rent payments. Okay. And then um, again, according to my spreadsheet, we keep about uh, thirty-five to 40000 a month in cash flow okay. is what it shows. But um, but that's not you know exactly 100% accurate because we keep buying. And so we're buying and we're doing other things and things like that. And then sometimes there might be something that comes up in a rental where – um, it needs a new AC unit or something like that. And so there goes, you know, 5,000 of what was going to be that cash flow. But um, but with our lease option properties, they take care of the maintenance of the majority of everything, except if it's like big things. Like if there's a roof leak, let us know. And then if there's a roof leak, we might renegotiate maybe that that final price that we had determined was going to be the, the purchase price. We might increase that because we put on a new roof or something like that. Um, or if... Um, or you know, discount it if they fix it themselves, maybe, right? Well, I mean, if they fix it themselves and they get a, you know, a new roof with the property, now they have a new roof. You know what I mean? And so it, there's that value that, that comes along with it. So, but we allow them to do a lot of cool stuff to their properties. They can paint it, you know, the colors that they want, as long as it's like not like crazy colors. They can paint it as long as it's a relatively normal color. Um, but we've had people put in like uh, driveways and they put in, you know, fences and landscape, the whole thing. And They've done a lot of really cool stuff because there's pride of ownership there. There's, hey, I'm planning on buying this property. And the people that usually do a lot of that stuff do end up exercising the option. So we've had five people exercise the option. One of them switched over to seller financing. So we're doing that financing for them. But then we've had just four people get loans on the properties and buy them. And they've all been able to buy them well under market value. And so they walked into a lot of equity and they were really happy. And a lot of that's because the market has just gone crazy. Yeah. And you're so, not trying to you're not trying to gouge them out of that out of their equity by charging a super high price. No, so usually well we're we're switching up a couple of things right now, but what we were doing historically is we would take the property, we would in, we would increase the purchase price by about 7 to 10% over a 3-year period of time. Because if you think historically if it goes up 3% per year, 
after three years, it should be, you know, 10% higher than what you bought it for. Just unfortunately, or fortunately, you know, with the last three years, I mean, I'd say the market's gone up like 30% or whatever. And so people are able to walk into like 30, 50, a hundred thousand dollars of equity. And so they're really happy about it. Oh yeah. Yeah. And so what we've done a little bit about is kind of started to toy with the idea of switching up some of the model. So when people give us that, you know, 4,000 or $5,000 option fee, what we say is you can buy the property um, within the next three years for what it appraises for at that time and you know reach out to us and we choose the appraiser the appraiser appraises the property you get under contract for that amount and then the bank will then order another appraisal on the property and then what we will do is we will give you back your option fee that you can use to buy the property at that price and then but we put a floor on it as long as it appraises for this amount or higher yeah. then this is what we'll do and so that's what we've done because we have like what we've we've lost out on like one property we lost out on $175,000 increase in equity. Oh, wow. I mean, we like the guy. We're happy that he was able to go and get that property. He loves the property. It's a beautiful property in the city that he grew up in. And so he's really happy with it. Um, but we're like, wow, that was a big, was oh, a big, you know, increase for him. All right. So then um, why don't you walk through an ex a typical example deal? And let's just use $100,000 for round numbers. You're sure. You're spending more than that, obviously, on a deal. Uh -huh. um, you're, what What are you trying to buy it at? And then after your fixed costs, what are you all in it for on average? And then what are you selling it for? So this is what we would do. For a deal that would have an ARV of 100, we would usually try to buy that at around 60. We bring, we probably put about 15 into it. Okay, so it's about 75. And then we'd probably get a loan for 70. We probably have a lease option buyer come in, give us a $4,000 option fee or maybe a 3000 if it's a lower price point, but a three or $4,000 option fee. So we're only into it about um, two to $5,000. And then they're going to be renting it. We're probably going to cash about about two or $300 on that one deal. And so and you, would, you would sell it to that. Then we would sell, it, like then we'd sell it that property for about 110. 110. Yeah. So just so rough numbers, you'd sell it for 110, but you'd be in it for 80. 70. 70. Yep. So that's a nice $40,000 spread. Yep. And so you take that and then you times that by, um, you know, 70. And all of a sudden that 40,000 becomes a lot more than 40. Yeah. It becomes significant. And the cool thing too, is you're just reinvesting your cash flow into the business, yeah. buying more deals. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what's your end game? What do you, what is your big goal with this? So, you know, that's a great question. And that kind of goes to, uh, you know, life purpose and things like that. You know what I mean? And, um, you know, I think that a lot of people have different purposes of, in life. And, um, you know, I was talking with a, a buddy of mine in one of our mastermind groups, uh, I think it was just yesterday, as to, you know, what what drives me? Why is it that I'm, you know, going so, so far and so quickly? Because my goal over the next 10 years, um, before I'm 50, is to uh, own $100 million worth of real estate. And um, to basically, um, and I've done some calculations, and according to what I think, it's going to be about 1,200 properties. So I need to increase by about 1,000 more properties over the next, you know, 10 years. And so the question is, you know, how am I going to do that? Um, and what is it going, going to require me to do that? You know what I mean? So there's changes that I'm going to need to make in order to get to that level. But the question that you had is, you know, why? And so... Uh, one thing that I really enjoy doing is I love watching high-level wrestling. And I'm not talking about WWE or anything like that. I'm talking about oh, of course, yeah. real, real wrestling, like uh, Olympic level or, um, you know, college level. They just finished the, um, what was it, the uh, NCAA wrestling tournament. And um, I am a Penn State fan. You know, they've won eight out of the last... 10 national championships. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you follow wrestling at all, but not uh, much, but um, I, I, I'm a good friend with uh, Russell Brunson, who's a okay. huge, huge wrestler. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, Kale Sanderson is the coach of uh, Penn state. And uh, he, in my opinion, is probably the greatest athlete um, for his, well, uh, the greatest athlete. Oh, come on, you, the, you wrestlers, you think you're the best athletes in well, the let world. Let me explain why. Let me explain why. Um, <laughs> not, not just because wrestling is super hard. No, I'm talking about the best athlete um, 
for his sport compared to anybody else for their own sport. And let me explain why. Uh, so he went, you know, through high school, uh, was I think a four time state champion. He then went to college and he never lost a match ever in college. Wow. There's no, there's never ever been another wrestler who's gone through all of college without losing a single match. That's so he was like 159 and zero. And then he goes to the Olympics and he takes gold. And then he comes and he starts coaching and he's won eight out of the last nine or eight out of the last 10 national championships. So, I mean, this last time um, he took second in, you know, nationals, um, but four out of the 10 weight divisions were his wrestlers who took first place. That's so that's how to create a winning mindset yeah. that you then just attract winners to you. You know what I mean? So the question uh, that you had is, you know, why? And, so I look at somebody like him and, and I would ask, well, why is he so great? His potential was to become so great. What if he had stopped? What if he had said, you know what? I did great in high school. I think I'm done. And a lot of people do. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, you do your, your thing and then you move on. But he had potential to do greater things. And so he went to college. He was great. But he didn't stop there. He went to the Olympics and was great. And then he didn't stop there. He then came and became um, to Penn State and became, you know, uh, an amazing coach creating this dynasty. You know what I mean? And a lot of his, um, his wrestlers go on to compete at Olympic levels. So, I mean, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. And so for me, I I've done, you know, I've gotten up to 200, but what is my potential? And I love Jim Rohn who says, you know, how tall does a tree grow? And the answer is, well, it grows as tall as it possibly can. It doesn't limit its potential. Only we as humans often limit our potential. And so yeah. if yeah. I can continue to grow and maintain a good relationship with my wife and my kids and with, and with good friends, if I can continue to grow and, and um, do more and build and I can maintain my integrity and all of those things, then I'm going to do that. I'm going to try to, to live to the, my greatest potential possible. And then I can, I can do a lot of good things with, with the money that comes to me. I mean, I employ a lot of people. To, to help me with my rehabs and, and all of those things. And so I'm able to help a lot of people in supporting their families and other things like that. And so I, I like to do that. I like to gather people around me. And, uh, you know, my wife and I um, have strong spiritual beliefs and things like that. And we like to, to help people feel loved and, and, you know, help, you know, be good examples and things like that. And so all of those things really motivate me to do well so that I can also be an example in, in several other areas of life. Love it. Mm -hmm. I'm just looking here at your bigger pockets profile. Uh, you got a lot of good articles, um, mm -hmm. forum posts, and uh, you just wrote one recently. By the way, I'd encourage you all go to Bigger Pockets. If you're not a member already to begin with, what's wrong with you? Bigger Pockets is a great resource for just networking, meeting people. Um, you don't go there to raise private money, but once you start networking and contributing and showing a lot of value, you can raise private money on there. Mm -hmm. You can sell your deals. Um, it's just a great way to, it's a great place to go get resources and education and networking, I think is the biggest value out of it. Um, so bigger pockets, you can look up Shiloh's profile here, or just look up Shiloh Lund Lundahl. Uh -huh. You wrote an article recently, mm -hmm. um, and it's called Better Than Burr, B-R-R-R-R, -R -R, introducing the B-R-R-R-L-O model. So right. talk about the Burlow method. I love this. So basically the Burr uh, strategy, as you know, and many other listeners know, is um, the, the, the phrase was coined by Brandon Turner, who uh, basically it's that you buy, you, you rehab, you rent, you refinance, and then you repeat the process, right? That's how you Burr a property. And as you do that, you're able to recycle your money and really grow a good portfolio. And so the Burlow model is basically the Burr, but then rather than just the idea of renting it out, you bring in a lease option tenant. And that, in my opinion, is better because what happens is if you keep a property long term, you may experience appreciation and you may, um, you know, have the debt pay down and then, you know, get that money. And, that, and that's fine. But what I like about the Burlow model is you get a higher rent. You don't have to worry about maintenance costs or, or turnover management. or management. Now you and still so, manage properties, obviously, right? But you don't have to. You don't have to have a dedicated property manager. You can have an assistant do it. 
Exactly. So my assistant actually manages the majority of our properties. And because we've grown so much, she actually has two assistants under her that help manage some properties as well. So, and those are a lot for the rentals that we have. But again, for our lease option properties, very low maintenance, very low management. So basically, um, you you cut out a lot of the costs, a lot of the, there's no, you know, very little turnover. There's um, low uh, maintenance. There's uh, no management fees. Uh, you get larger upfront things. deposit. Exactly. Larger upfront deposit. And so that makes it so the cash flow is greater. And then what's also great is that if you can take this and then sell it in, you know, three years, if they go to exercise the option, what's happening is you don't have to use a realtor to sell it because the person that came in is planning on buying it. And then also in our option agreement, it shows that they pay a lot of the closing costs. So basically when you sell a property, you're usually um, giving away, you know, seven to 9% of the, of the proceeds in, yeah. you know, closing costs. Here we give away 1%. And so that's an additional, you know, six to 8% that goes to us. And so that's great. And then what happens is, you know, uh, there's something called return on equity. And I, I know that you know this, but, you know, some of your listeners might not know it. And basically it means how much equity do I have in this property? And if I take that equity and, um, you know, I do a calculation, how much money, you know, what's my cash flow? And according to my cash flow, how much of a return on the equity am I making on this property? Is it 5%? Is it 6, 7, 8? Is it 10? Is it 20%? And so what happens is the longer you pay down the property, and the more it appreciates, the lower your return on your equity is. So when you can take properties and you can trade them up, that's where you really build a lot of momentum is this idea of trading them up. When you buy and hold, it, it's, it's good, but it's also slow. I like to trade things up. And I learned this uh, from the game cash flow. From the game cash flow, you try to get out of the rat race and you get these little rentals and you're trying to get your passive income greater than your expenses. And then as soon as you do that, you're out of the rat race. And so I had a lot of these properties and I wasn't selling any of them. I was getting, you know, 200 a month. And for me to get out of the rat race took a lot longer than if I had, had traded it, got a chunk of money and then bought bigger deals. So that's what we've learned is starting to trade up. And so like recently I posted a, a, a video on my YouTube channel about this 1031 exchange that we did. So let me just go over the numbers real quick. We bought a property in Casa Grande, for $57,000, okay? It was a two bedroom, actually it was a one bedroom, one bath, 1200 square foot home. When you think of that square footage and you think of one bedroom, one bath, what do you think of? An apartment. <laughs> okay, um, yes, but also there's gotta be room in there to add another bedroom. Sure, right? of course. And so we added another bedroom. Now we made it a two one. We were then able to rent it out for like seven, no, I think it was about $800 a month. And then it continued to appreciate, right? And then it appreciated. Now we're able to sell it for like 238, I think. You know, 235, 238. We sold it. And then rather than having the money come to us, we 1031 exchanged like $50,000 into buying this small eight unit mobile home park that was right close to another mobile home park that we had. And we got that on, uh, it was a seller finance deal where they were gonna hold 230 we bought it for 275. So that 50,000 went to that property, right? And then we now have this property that now is going to cash flow. I think it's probably going to cash for like 1200 to $1,500, this little mobile home park, nice. right? So we went from making $200 down making $1,500. And then we were able to get a second, you know, lender in on that deal for 50,000. And I was able to pull out my 50,000. And um, and that deal is probably going to be worth about four, about four fifty. Wow. Um, so I mean, that's the power of trading up. So yeah. it's neat as these lease options start to come up in twenty twenty two. So next year is going to be a huge year for us because we're going to have so many of these lease options come up where we're either going to be able to sell them or we're going or they exercise them or we uh, trade them up. Um, if we sell them or we just lease option them again at a higher amount, you know what I mean? So there's so, you know, uh, forgive the redundancy, but with lease options, there's so many options. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just fantastic. This is really good. It reminds me of a book that I read when I was first getting started. I have it right over there. 
Um, it's called Buy Low, Rent Smart, Sell High. It's a great book written in 2004, 5, 2006. Mm -hmm. Buy Low, Rent Smart, Sell High. You guys can get it on Amazon. You should really check it out. And it's all about this subject here. Um, we're getting some good questions from people in here. Do you mind if I yeah, go for it. ask you real quick? Uh, Daniel's saying, what is the 1% closing cost? Or where is the 1% closing cost going to? Is that going to the title company? That's just closing costs you're paying. Yeah. So like, for instance, when you close on a property, um, there's going to be some, sometimes there's some taxes or there's um, some other things that need to be uh, paid. And so the seller or the buyer pays a lot of the closing costs, but there's still just a little bit that the um, that's usually the seller's responsibility to make sure that they get paid. So that's just us. Well, there's also, guys, I'm going to post here in the comments. I'm not sure if you're going to see it, guys. And if you're um, if you are listening to this later, if you just go to Bigger Pockets and do a search for uh, better than Burr, introducing the Burr Low method, mm -hmm. or just look up Shiloh Lindahl's um, articles here. You'll see this article and you do a real good job here breaking down into a table all mm -hmm. the numbers. One column is traditional Burr strategy and the next column is adding the lease option on there. Right. You do a real good job and it, it, you, you show here your, um, your total profit after three years minus original investment is much higher using mm -hmm. a lease option. On the end. Right. But it also is your internal rate of return. Right. It's just yeah. massively, massively yeah. better, right? And, and that's really what it is. So like, you know, everybody knows cash on cash return is, you know, how much have I put in? How much do I get out? What's my rate? You know, is it a 12%, a 15% return? Um, but when you take the IRR, you know, where you add up all of your return from the property and then you divide it, you know, by the number of years, that's really the important number. And what we usually get, our, our IRR is usually well over 100%, sometimes in the thousands. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, good question here from Bill. How long is your typical lease option period? Do you have a credit repair program? What percentage of your tenants are able to exercise the option? Those are all awesome questions. So let me answer each of those. Uh, how long is our typical lease option? We started with five years and then we went to four and then we went to three. The reason we started with five is because we were getting commercial loans that were five years long. We wanted to make sure that the option period ended before our loan was um, up for renewal. Okay, so that's why we started with five, but then we we lowered it because we wanted, you know, in 2022 to have all of these coming up about the same time, so we could trade them into larger deals, maybe apartment complexes or other things like that. Um, and now we just customarily have them for about three years, and so that's kind of what we've kind of settled on. Um, and then do we have a credit repair program? We don't have a program for that, but what we do. Excuse me. What we do is we will anybody that says, "Hey, I I want to start working towards um, buying the property." We will then connect them with one of the banks that we use, with a banker, and then the banker says, "This is what you need," and then starts working with them over the next six months to help them get to the place where they can buy the property. Yep. Does that make sense? So it's a, it's a period of time because they need to get their credit where it needs to be. All they have to do is start working with the banker, saying, "Hey, I'm looking to buy this house. What do I need?" And then just do the things that the banker tells them to do. Yeah. So, and then the next one, uh, what percentage of your tenants exercise the lease options? So I think historically they'll say about 15% exercise the lease options. I think that ours are going to be higher for a couple of reasons. One is because the, the market's appreciated so much that um, so many people are going to be able to walk into so much more equity that I think that the, um, the uh, drive to exercise it is just going to be greater. Um, and then two, uh, we've worked with good tenants, good screening, so that we have good tenants in there. And I think that there, we don't put a tenant in there that we think is not going to be able to buy the property. So yeah. all of our tenants need to make at least three times the purchase price. And that's about, you know, when you go to get the loan, you need to show, hey, I, I earn enough to be able to buy this property. Well, the rent needs to be, their income needs to be three times the rent. Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, that, that's what I meant to say. And um when they go to get the loan, they're going to need to qualify that way anyway. So we bring people in that if they can re work through repairing the credit, they will likely be able to buy the property. So my guess is that ours is probably going to be uh, upwards of 25, maybe a little bit higher percent is my guess. Yeah. So uh, t tell me again, the, the type of house that you typically do this with, what price range, cl what class or whatever you want to call yeah. it. I really like, the B minus 
to the C properties with lease options for several reasons, but that's what I like the most. Okay. And the reason being, or some of the reasons are um, the higher price points, the cash flow tends to be lower. And the if something does go wrong, and maybe you didn't see that there was an issue with the roof, I'm going to have to come in and take care of that. It's probably going to cost me much more than if it's on a little bit cheaper of a property. Okay. Um, now there might be more appreciation, but if we lock in the, the appreciation price already, then we don't get to enjoy all of the extra appreciation that happens. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, I like working with people that are just really grateful to get a property. So somebody that's been wanting to buy, but they have had a hard time being able to buy or their credit's not in a good, good enough place, or they hey, just started their own business and the bank won't lend them money. I like working with those people because they go in their working class and they'll look at a property and they're willing to accept the little nuances with the property that's not not perfect. And so a lot of our properties are not perfect. Very rarely do we have a property that's fully rehabbed. Right. And we market most of our properties as either light fixers or fixer uppers so that when they come in, they have the mindset of, oh, I need to go in and put my own personal touch to this. I might need to paint here or I might... Um, uh, need to put in new floors or whatever. And we'll allow somebody to come in and they can put in the floors that they want to put in. And then if they don't exercise the option, we just say, hey, keep your receipt on the upgrade that you did. As long as you got the, it okayed with us, we'll pay you back your the, the cost of the materials that you put in. Not the labor, but the materials yeah. will we'll replace that. Um, so they can go and they can customize the house. And so um, that's... Uh, that's what we're doing. And I think I, I might have even forgot the question. I think I was going off all over the place with that one. Sorry about well, that. That's good. We were talking about the class or the style. Of the oh, class. yeah, yeah. So the class, I really like the C the the C to the B minus because yep. I think the price points are better there for cash flow. And you get a, a tenant that usually is less entitled. I have an issue with entitled tenants. <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> We've only had one tenant that was like super entitled. <laughs> so out of 200, one tenant, actually, I would say two now. Two out of 200. So one out of 100, I think that's pretty good, right? Um, but yeah, I have an issue with entitled entitlement. And so I like people that look into it and they say, hey, there, there's this thing wrong with it, nothing wrong, but I can go and I can fix those things. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Fix those things because that's what you would do if it was your property. You wouldn't go to the bank and say, hey, look, um, I know you gave me a loan for the property, but uh, you know, the, somebody came and threw a, window at the ro at the, threw a rock at the window, it broke it. Will you come and replace it? The bank's going to say, no, it's your property. Replace it. So, well, and, and a lot of these tenant buyers, they want to do that work themselves. They want to pick their own carpet. They want to pick their own color, their own flooring, uh, their, their their own cabinets and countertops yeah. and stuff like that. And a lot of them have like a, a brother or a cousin that does flooring. You know, in Arizona, it seems like everybody has a family member that does something with a house. Oh, yeah. So they come in and they'll, they'll help them out for a weekend and, hey, you got cool floors, you know, and then they're happy and things like that. Right. Uh, just a couple more questions here. Um, this is from Bill. Do you work with a mortgage broker to make sure the tenants are capable of obtaining financing? Yeah. So you work with the same mortgage broker that's financing these houses for you, right? So, uh, yes, we, we've done that before. But because bank policies change and stuff, I work with a lot of different bankers because, you know, one year, one banker helps me a ton. And then something changes with their bank. And now yeah. I'm like, uh, I'm not going to bring yeah. people to you anymore. I have to go to another bank. So the answer is yes. We don't do that when we get someone in there in the, at the beginning. But as soon as they've been in there for a while and they reach out and say, hey, I want to work towards buying the property, then we say, great, This here's two or three bankers you can reach out to and start working with them on getting loan a loan for the property. Yep. Very good. One final question here. Uh, I guess the big advantage to sell on a lease option rather than a wrap is that you can use a depreciation. Is that the case? Did you understand that? Oh, I lost you, Bill. I don't know if it's me. I'm here. Sorry. I'm, I, was going, I, called you, I called you Bill. Bill asked the question. Shiloh, <laughs> you're the one on the show. Sorry. Got it. Did so, you understand um, Bill's question? I did understand it. Okay. All right. So what I would say, um, so basically the question is, uh, you know, why, uh, let me see it one more time. Um, advantage of doing the lease option rather than the wrap. Um, I would do the lease option because when it comes to doing a wrap mortgage, when you close on that mortgage, that buyer, well, there's a couple of reasons. That buyer 
um, now has the the mortgage, you know, around your mortgage. And if they stop paying, you need to foreclose on them. Yeah. And that's a process. And then after you foreclose on them, then you need to um, evict them. That whole thing is a process. We did that once. And then we decided, mm, I don't like this so much. Let's just go ahead and do the lease options. They're easier. If they stop paying, they, you know, they're more likely to just move because they haven't closed on it. And um, we can evict them. Now, most of our lease option people do pay. Uh, very rarely do does one stop paying. Right. And so, um, and even in the uh, the whole eviction moratorium and the, and the pandemic, the majority of our pro of our lease option people were paying. There was only one that stopped paying, and she actually had issues well before the pandemic, and then just used the pandemic as an opportunity for her to stay in the property for you know an extra eleven months, which sure. was frustrating. Um, so that's why we do it is because um, it's a much more difficult process of getting them out of the property. And um, yeah, so that's basically it. Now the depreciation though, mm -hmm. do you lose the depreciation when you're selling it on a wrap? That's a good question. I have to ask my, my accountant. My accountant is the one that uh, takes care of all of, of those questions. And when, when um, you look at your, and on this article in particular in bigger pockets, and you're looking at your numbers, are you counting in appreciation, depreciation in here as well? No, I don't think those numbers are accounting for depreciation. Because also, from what I understand, is when you sell a property, you have to do the... You have to recapture it. Yeah. So unless you 1031 exchange it. And so uh, that's why I didn't count it there is because, you know, you might yeah. get it, but then you might have to give it back. All right. Very cool. Um, this has been awesome. Shiloh, I sure appreciate having you on the show. It's been way longer than I I, I expected. So I apologize for holding you so long, but... Um, it's really good. How can people get a hold of you if they have questions? Maybe they want to partner with you on some deals or they want to talk to you about what you do and what you do. That's the best yeah. way. So there's a, a couple of ways that they can get a hold of me. Um, you can connect with me on Bigger Pockets. That's one way. You can um, have a website, uh, blueequities.com. Um, and I, I explain my coaching on that website. Uh, so you go to blueequities.com slash coaching. Talk about Blue, that there. Blueequities.com. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yep. And then also uh, I'm trying to build my YouTube channel um, so I can beat my buddy in the first one to a thousand uh, subscribers because whoever wins is going to um, the company will then pay for them and their family to go on a vacation up to $6,000. Oh, so we're so in where, this. Where are you guys at? How many subscribers do you both have? So he has 200 and I have 143. Okay. As of this morning. <laughs> so, um, but I, you know, it was so interesting um, with YouTube and everything, you think that you're going to create this awesome video that's going to go awesome and you put it out there and then it's a dud and then you create another video that was just like, okay, and it does really well. So, you know, all of those things you never really know, but I put a lot of effort into this like a Monopoly video that I did recently and it just didn't do as well as I thought. And so it really kind of killed my motivation. So I haven't posted in like a week or two. So I'm going to get back to that. But yeah, I, uh, that's another way that you can connect with me is through YouTube. I will probably well, respond more there more quickly. Go ahead. It looks like your channel is called um, Improve Channel on Real Estate Investing. Is that right? Yes. Nice. Well, I just subscribed. Awesome. So now you have 144. Okay. And then if you were promised to not subscribe to my buddies. I won't. No, until I after. I lost you there. You... Sorry You're about back. back. Yeah. You're back. Yeah. Until I get a thousand uh, subscribers, then you can subscribe to his. All right. Bill's going to subscribe to you as well. And Fantastic. so is Kenneth. Come on. Awesome. All right. Very good. So guys, go check out, just do a search for Shiloh Lindahl, Lundahl mm -hmm. in uh, the YouTube world and you'll see his channel and call it's called Improved Channel on Real Estate Investing. Mm -hmm. Looks like you got some pictures of some of the little uh little tiny houses yeah you you tiny houses thank you <laughs> so yeah we'll that's talk. one that's one thing that we're really excited about is building this tiny house community down in yeah. florence arizona we didn't get to that but that's that's awesome and then also the costa rican house that we're gonna buy we didn't talk about that but that's super cool oh nice all right so thank you shiloh for being on the show mm -hmm. appreciate you very much best of luck to you and best of luck to your family and your and your business ventures so awesome We'll see you guys later. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Joe, so much for letting me be on your show and for this talk. It was awesome. Appreciate it. 
Look, you got four more subscribers here. Here's uh, <laughs> Seal, and here's Daniel. I've subscribed to. <laughs> Beautiful. That's All right. Awesome. We'll see you guys all later. Take care, awesome. everybody. All right.